Welcome back to the Psy Fireplace. I'm talking about the one, two, three, four, five books that I read since the last review video. Going in ascending order from worst to best. Worst is This Fortress World by James Gunn, which I would not qualify as, qualify, I would not designate as a bad book, nor would I designate it as a good book. James Gunn was, I think, a fairly minor figure. Uh, he was around in the 50s through the, I don't know, 80s, I would guess. I don't know. I didn't really do my due diligence in researching his background. This is his first novel, I do know that, and it was published in 1955. And it's so-so. It's an interesting um, little book. I would say it's a perfect five. So I do this game. I've been playing this game with Actually, the guy who really got me into reading science fiction in the first place, this family friend that I've known since I was born, he came up with this game called Perfect Five, where you try to figure out a movie or a whatever that is a perfect five out of ten. So it can't be good enough to qualify as a six. It can't be bad enough to be a four. It has to be perfectly, five, perfectly neutral, perfectly inoffensive, neither good nor bad. And this is, I think, the first science fiction novel, Perfect Five, that I've ever read. So it's about this guy who is an acolyte in this church in a far future world uh, with little, it's got like little space opera flavors. And it's based on a really interesting premise, which is there have been all of these galactic wars, all of these upheavals and changing of hands of political systems and tyrannies. And it's kind of equaled out to this detente where every single planet is its own little fiefdom. And there's kind of this Cold War stalemate between all of the planets where they're totally isolated from each other and isolationist in regards to one another. There's a little bit of trade and commerce. But other than that, the costs of invading a new world outweigh the benefits of doing so. So imperialism meets its end and the, the entire universe and the entire human species is just stuck in this permanent state of stagnation where uh, all the worlds are ruled by basically mobs, mafias, and petty tyrants. On this particular world where this takes place that is not Earth, the ruling class is in league with the church, this, I think it's Catholic church, that ministers to this gigantic population of paupers, um, like violent criminals and, you know, uh, menial workers. And it's a cool, like, background. It's a cool world that he constructed. The actual narrative itself isn't that interesting. Surprisingly violent and bleak. Uh, there's a torture scene in this that is pretty grim. And uh, it's like a love story. And there's this MacGuffin. It's this marble that has unknown, you know, uh, borderline magical powers that might be the key to unlock man's future of, you know, a united, a reunited mankind. It's just whatever. It's kind of whatever. Um, started out really slow. It got really interesting for like a couple chapters, and then it just tapered off into this fairly predictable plot. I don't really remember anything at all about it, just that I read it and uh, that it didn't particularly wow me. It's a perfect five. Would I recommend it? Not really. I think you just got the good part of it listening to me talk about the premise. Okay, the next one, I'm, I know that this next one is gonna disappoint slash piss off a lot of you. It's The Player of Games by Ian M. Banks. Oh no, oh god. No author has been more consistently requested of me to read than Ian M. Banks. I had listened to part of Consider Phlebas on audiobook during a car trip and I found it so boring that I had to turn it off uh, for fear of falling asleep at the wheel. To be fair to that book, I didn't finish it, and I was also distracted while I was driving, so maybe I misread it. I did read the entirety of Player of Games, which is touted as this major mega classic of space opera, one of the best ever written. And I have to tell you, I found it really dull. I found it really disappointing. And it's not like I hate the book. Um, but I did find it irritating. I did find it not all that fun to read and not very rewarding to read, actually pretty frustrating, and it became a chore to finish, I have to say. Again, I didn't necessarily dislike it, and it's hard to divorce the reading of the book and my opinion of the book from the hype around the book, which is something that popular books definitely suffer from. But still, 
I, I, it just didn't hit for me. I don't, uh, I, I just don't resonate with it that much. The basic premise is a member of the culture, which is this gigantic, uh, galactic empire. It's like a non-hierarchical kind of anarcho-socialist utopia, dystopia of total sexual permissiveness and post-scarcity. So everybody lives a fundamentally perfect life. Um, but it's rough around the edges, like it's uh, maintained through kind of covert state violence. Kind of an interesting premise, and there's this guy who's the most famous, one of the most famous players of games, like a game master board games, and uh, publishes theories about it and writes books about it, and he's tapped for a big mission at the end of his career when he's becoming cynical and bored by games and he's sent to this planet far distant planet to participate in this big game that's like the foundational premise of this entire civilization this like massively complicated game that's like kind of roughly sketched out the rules are never totally explained which is fine and versus the culture this Empire is strictly hierarchical, bigoted, and extremely violent, sadistic. There's all kinds of sexual sadism and really gnarly violence going on. And uh, he's thrust into this position of participating in like this big game that determines the future of the Empire and his role in the culture and his role in this, this Empire as this outsider. I found it way so bloated i found it crazy bloated it takes about this long for anything like relevant directly relevant to that plot that i just described to start happening all this is all like backstory on the guy and his friendships with various uh, ai machines and his sexual dalliances with people and and then the book starts and then a couple things happen here and then the ending is a big letdown to me. There's all of this buildup, all of this buildup pointing towards a particular ending that I thought was gonna happen, that I was excited to read. And then it's just like, ah, well, then this and this happens and like the end. <laughs> it, it just felt like such a cop-out ending after such a long read. I also thought that Banks was trying to do this Ursula Le Guin thing, this Hainish thing, like uh, Dispossessed specifically, where it was a culture clash, so to speak, between the culture and the culture's values and this empire, this evil empire that is clearly meant to be um, met a metaphor or like an allegory for our, our, you know, individualist, capitalist, war and profit driven society that we live in telling you all of the most obvious kind of moral lessons that go along with that and painting that in the broadest possible strokes, the most cartoonishly outstated kinds of evil and political commentary, kind of a high schooler's version of capitalism versus socialism and nowhere close to being worthy of Le Guin. I just found it way on the nose. Frustrating also because the main character doesn't have a satisfying character arc to me. There are some fun action scenes. There's some fun, you know, the culture is kind of interesting. It made me not want to read any other culture novels. And my understanding is that this, this is the thriller. This is the fast paced, um, snappy one. And I, at this point, dread, I, like Accession is supposed to be the other great one. And maybe eventually I'll get around to that. I, I think it's just not for me. It made me appreciate Alistair Reynolds more because I read, um, what was the first, the, uh, what is the book? Revelation Space. And I thought, I thought that it was kind of mediocre. And obviously he's a peer of Banks, like him, Banks, and Peter F. Hamilton are the big three of British modern space opera. Alistair Reynolds is trying to do something really complicated and that lives very consciously in this continuum of science fiction literature. It feels like an older book. It feels like kind of closer to the older space operas and a little, like a little bit of the new wave stuff, a little bit of cyberpunk. It feels more like the kind of thing that I really like to read. 
and this feels way off. This feels like kind of a daytime Warner Brothers rendition of, of that. So it did put a little rose around the edges for Alistair Reynolds for me. And also as an addendum to that video, I know that uh, that was his first book and I, I am definitely very interested in reading some of his later stuff like House of Sons that's supposed to be better. But anyway, I just don't think Banks is for me. Next is Deus Ex by Norman Spinrad. I found this at a used bookstore last week and I read it in a couple of hotel rooms in a couple sittings. And uh, Spinrad, I read Iron Dream, which is the Hitler book that I thought was splendid. I really loved that book. This is the first kind of straight and narrow Spinrad as Spinrad book that I've read. I thought it was mixed. Overall, I did like it. It's kind of this meta cyberpunk novel that is a commentary uh, on other like foregoing cyberpunk novels and, and genre conventions that is mixed up with a lot of religious themes and spiritual themes. There are sequences of this book that are really wonderful, that I really love, uh, where Spinrad is firing on, on all cylinders. The writing quality is really good. The character, singular, is really interesting. The priest, there's like two main characters. The priest character, I think, is great. Really smartly written. The uh, Everything else kind of is a little rough. I came really close to setting this book down and walking away and not reading it after a few pages because it opens on the other protagonist character who's a um, hacker or like cyber shaman guy who is black and takes every opportunity and everything that he says to remind you that he's black and talks in this really hackneyed and cringy black guy voice and it just sucked so bad it's just so it aged so poorly and it's like full body just like oh god other than that, the book is pretty good. It takes place kind of in the midst of a climate apocalypse where the Earth's oceans have risen, environmental conditions are terrible, and uh, I think there has been a lot of mass death. And the main character floats around on this book called The Mellow Yellow, kind of jive-talking his way across the globe, taking his black ass wherever the winds of chance prevail. He's able to interface with virtual reality that's similar to the one from Neuromancer. And he's called upon by what remains of the Catholic Church to try to speak to the dead, essentially like speak to the AIs that live in this virtual world where um, people can have their consciousness transcoded into virtual reality where they can, uh, a facsimile of, their, of themselves can live on indefinitely, eternally, in the computer, which is like a, a familiar science fiction premise. So he has to go into this world to uh, try to fix a bad situation for the church. And uh, pretty cool world building. And I really like this. He doesn't like spend that much time fleshing this out. It's just kind of an aside or two, but it's my favorite part of the book, actually, this vision of a post-climate apocalypse world where it, like, everything that's shitty about life now carries over where it's like, all right, I'm floating in this infinite hot ocean that's been depleted of most of its marine life. And I still have to like go to work. I still have to go to my shitty job. And also his version of cyberspace is, is just like, well, it's not even that cool. It's not that immersive. It, they can't do full sensory input. So it's just audio visual and it's full of ads and it's all like pixelated. So it just kind of sucks. It just, the world just kind of sucks. The plot itself gets really interesting and there's this other main character, this, this elderly priest who's preparing to die and going through, like attempting to die with dignity and to resolve spiritual conflicts in his life and thinking about his position higher up in the Roman Catholic Church. And then it, it moves into, um, these fairly convoluted like spiritual logic problems of trying to delineate what a soul is and the main conundrum of the book is are these AIs, these transcended uh, AI programs capable of having souls because they are directly representative of their living counterparts now deceased? Does their soul pass on? to their AI counterpart? Do they have their own soul? Are they able, are they capable of transcendence? Uh, do they have any 
spiritual properties at all, or are they purely satanic? Are they an obscenity? Is it man's attempt to cheat God out of judgment and to uh, manufacture kind of a cheap, chintzy, permanent afterlife for themselves? Pretty interesting stuff. It does get a little too convoluted, a little, a little bit up its own ass, and the resolution I found pretty saccharine and um, unsatisfying. It's kind of the most like f cartoony, foregone answer to these questions that you could think of and sent overly sentimental, that's where it goes, which is kind of a disappointment. I also like Spinrad, I think, and I want to read more of him to get a bigger picture, but in this book, I did, he rubbed me a little bit the wrong way because he gets into this territory of writing as a transgressive writer, and it, it just has this, this very, like, kind of C.M. Kornbluth as, as, ciphered through George Carlin feel to him, where he's very cynical and dark and despairing and mocking, but it's in this uh, uh, annoying way. But everything else about the book, I really like. This is definitely like way over the threshold of Perfect Five them. This is closer to like a seven out of 10 or something. Not that I really enjoy rating books that much anymore. The next was The Time Dweller by Michael Moorcock, which interestingly, came to me in a big haul of Moorcock books that my friend Justine from Verbatim Books in San Diego gave me. And I adore this physical object of a book. I think it's one of my favorite covers of any book that I own. And there's something about the paper stock of this particular paperback that was, I just loved reading. I loved holding this in my hand and reading it. And that pushed me over the edge of reading it because actually I had already picked it on the random pick because I had this older DAW version of it that looks fairly uh, hideous. And I got partway into the first story and I had just kind of powered through a bunch of science fiction books. At the time I was a little bit burned out and I just, I just set it down. I didn't want to finish it. And then I got that one and I, I did. Okay, so long story short, I read the book or short story long rather. I thought it was mixed, but um, there was only, it's a short story collection, a bunch of short stories and one novella. And the novella was The Deep Fix, which was the namesake story of his band, Michael Moorcock and The Deep Fix was the name of his rock band that I didn't know about until I researched the novella. Um, I thought it was, I remember very little about it. I just remember thinking that it was overly long and not very good or interesting. But there were other stories in this that I thought were great. The first two stories were definitely my favorite. The first two stories and the last story I thought were really wonderful. Um, the first one was The Time Dweller. Second one was Escape from Evening. Both of them take place on uh, Dying Earth. Earth feels very, very, very much like Jack Vance. It, two different meditations on the nature of time, the passage of time, and uh, some cool like world building stuff. Both really interesting. The second one especially, I thought had some really like cool, compelling, and philosophically significant things to say about the nature of memory and nostalgia, yearning to live in a past uh, that isn't accessible to you anymore and kind of how time might work. Uh, there's a couple characters that are very Elric-y. There's another story in here called The Golden Barge. It's about a guy who is chasing a golden barge, which I think is an import from the Elric stories too, or maybe this is just a recurring motif in his fiction, The Eternal Champion Cycle. I know it all takes place in the same general uh, continuum. It meets a woman who is seductive and mysterious, goes to interesting, cool places. And uh, the last one I thought might have been the best short story in the whole collection, and I think is probably the best Moorcock that I've read, called The Mountain. It's about a post-apocalyptic world where there are two men in the North Country, I think somewhere in Scandinavia, who think that they may be the last living human beings, and they're following the tracks of the third final living, hopefully, human being, who one of them is convinced is a female and is obsessed with finding her and starting the human race back up again. Um, and the other one is less interested. 
in that. And very brief, short story, very, very short. I thought it was great. I thought it was superb. And the ending is really weird and uh, uncanny and unsettling. Again, says really interesting things about kind of consciousness and human values and uh, just starkly memorable, like really well rendered, clear prose, really well written. And I know that uh, Moorcock was prolific. He wrote a ton of quantity, but I was impressed with the consistency of the quality too. I don't think that it really suffered all that much. I think um, the deep fix did suffer from bandwidth issues. Like it was just quantity over quality and it was just this big jumble of ideas. That again, I like b can barely recall. But overall, I was pretty smitten with Moorcock, and that's my experience every time that I read him. Not that I've read all that much of him, but I just, I, I like, I like Moorcock. I like his writing, and I like his values. The final one, definitely by far the best, was A Case of Conscience by James Blish. Thank you again to Moyd for sending me this copy um, in the mail. This is a, a UK Arrow paperback. I have read one other Blish. The Day After Judgment, and I loved this book. I didn't realize until after I finished reading it that it was the final book in a series of four books that are loosely connected. This one is a direct sequel to Black Easter, and this is the first in kind of this loose quadrilogy, and I don't remember what the other book title is, and I also don't remember the name of the series, I apologize. Um, but these are very close in feeling and themes, unsurprisingly. Um, this is considered one of his mega classics. Cities in Flight is what he's most known for. Actually, what he's most known for is writing the novelizations of the original Star Trek episodes. That's what made him popular, made him most of his money, and he was an editor and critic and one of the first people to take science fiction really seriously and hold it to a high standard. He was famous for, um, I think as John Campbell was, having really stringent standards for scientific accuracy in science fiction literature. And you can tell reading both books, and especially this one, how deeply literate he is, both in terms of the sciences and the humanities. Astonishing breadth and depth of expertise in multiple um, fields that carries over into the work and gives it an interesting and very, like, specifically blish flavor. The book concerns a small party of humans who travel to make first contact with a race of reptilian aliens who live on this planet that appears to be a utopia. They're kind of in a semi-stunted period of technological development where they, they don't have technologies that are familiar to us and take it for, take it, taken for granted by us, but they do have access to certain technologies that are mysterious to us that we don't fully understand that they got to first, like certain kinds of jet propulsion and this communication system that has to do with this massive tree that's grown in its roots to interface with this big subterranean crystalline structure that acts as this conduit for these, um, radio-like waves by which they communicate. So they manipulate the tree's roots to produce certain frequencies or, or resonances in the, the grounds to communicate instantaneously over long distance, kind of an Ansible type tree device. And uh, they have no social problems. There is no conflict, no murder, no crime. And the humans don't understand how this can be possible. And the task of the humans is to decide whether or not to invite them to join the United Nations, which is now kind of like the Federation from Star Trek. One of the members of this party is a Jesuit priest who has deep reservations about the planet. And uh, it's, it's how that worry plays out over the course of the humans coming to know these reptile aliens and one of them coming to Earth. It asks some fairly interesting and complicated questions like, um, is it possible to be moral and secular in the specific way that Christians are moral? If God and the devil are real, is it possible for the devil to directly influence physical phenomena in the universe? And 
is there a distinction between divine intervention and physics as we understand it? So if God moves in the world of human affairs and direct physical causality, everyday phenomena, can it be distinguished as divine intervention? And does it diminish the divinity of the intervention if it is explicable through uh, normal means? And this gets deep, deep into the philosophy of these questions, sometimes at a pretty great cost to the narrative. Like there is a portion of maybe two or three pages where the Jesuit character is just uh, walking himself through some kind of a logic problem in Finnegan's Wake, which is every bit as uh, exciting a piece of reading as you might expect. And the narrative is a little weird because it jumps from one novella to a second novella. It's kind of a fix-up novel. I think this was originally published just as a short story and then had another half of it tacked on for the novel. People don't like the second book. I really do. I think that it's quite good. I really like the world building in the second book. It's an earth where during the Cold War, instead of, uh, or in supplementation to the arms race, there is a bunker race, I think is actually what he calls it, where um, major cities start tunneling downwards and building downwards. They have these big labyrinthine bunkers constructed under the cities for the population to live in, and the human race goes underground. And they become so um, in fear of the threat of nuclear Armageddon. And they become so dependent upon these underground networks and the energy systems that they've built and the social system that they've built around the, this this kind of bunker reality where the surface of the world is, is pretty much completely abandoned that they can't uh, undo it, that humanity is just trapped underground potentially forever. And there are all of these rising building tides of growing discontent and political violence and psychosis, this kind of political psychosis that completely is is so like eerily prescient of people stumbling into all of these new jingoisms and uh, political madnesses and obsessions. If it was written today, it would be too on the nose. It would make my eyes roll, but because it was written in what, like 1955, 58, uh, incredible, incredible. Like on par with John Brunner. The ending is wonderful too. It's very, it's left very open-ended and enigmatic, narratively satisfying. Uh, uh, for being such a short book, there is an incredible amount that's packed in here. Even though the narrative is a little bit herky-jerky, uneven, uh, some of the prose, excuse me, is um, beautifully done. And uh, there's something about the subjective tone of this book, like Day After Judgment, that gets way under my skin. There's something really unique about it. That uh, Blish has this feel. I feel like I'm in the presence of greatness when I'm reading Blish, which is a feeling that I really like. I like feeling like I'm in expert hands. Okay, those are the five that I've read. Um, I'm tempted to do Mirror Shades, but I'm more tempted to do a random pick because it's been too long since I've actually done one. And the list is up to, let's see here, 410 books. It's gonna be... No, it's no, it's no, no. Uh, no, it's, ah, uh, fuck me. I'm not reading that. It wasn't valid anyway because I forgot to delete those ones from the list. Okay, so round two. Tono Bungay. Oh, that's an interesting one. That's an H.G. Wells. Uh, there's a handful of these H.G. Wells books that are not that well known, and this is uh, definitely one of them. I got this great Signet classic paperback. I don't really know anything about it, but, uh, I, you know, Hard pressed to imagine that an H.G. Wells book is going to be bad. So, yeah, curious about this one. We'll see. Okay, thanks for watching.